Biology, the study of life, is not separate from chemistry. Chemistry is the study of matter and its interactions, known as chemical reactions. All matter is chemically based. All living things depend up upon chemical reactions happening both inside and outside of cells. When those chemical reactions stop, so does life. To understand biology is to understand the role of chemistry in life. You'll help yourself immensely if you do the assigned reading in chapter two of your biology textbook. This video will hit on some of the major points, but it's not meant to replace the reading assignment. Let's start with reviewing some basic chemistry. I hope you all remember the basic model of the atom, a very small atomic nucleus that contains the protons and with the exception of normal hydrogen, neutrons. Protons have a positive electric charge and a mass of one atomic mass unit. Neutrons have no electric charge and also have a mass of one atomic mass unit. Moving around the nucleus are electrons. The electrons are involved in the chemical energy of the atom. These electrons have a negative electric charge and occupy specific spaces around the nucleus called energy level shells. In normal atoms, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons in the nucleus. This means that a normal atom is electrically neutral since the positive protons cancel out the negative electrons. Lots of different kinds of atoms have been discovered. They all have different chemical properties based on the number of protons and electrons they have. Each different kind of atom is called a chemical element. Each element is defined by their atomic number. The periodic table that you may be familiar with is organized in a way that groups the elements into families based on similar properties. A Russian chemist by the name of Dmitry Mendeleev back in the 1800s is credited for organizing the table in the way it is now. There are four elements that combined make up nearly 97% of matter in, in living things. They are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Add phosphorus, sulfur, and calcium, and you're closer to 98% of the elements of living things. And what's interesting to me is that all living things contain similar chemical elements. In all, there are about 25 different elements necessary for life. With the exception of ionic forms of calcium, sodium, and potassium, none of them exist in living things in their elemental or atomic form. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur are combined into organic compounds. But before I talk about complex molecules of compounds, let's quickly review elements. To get information about each element, you'll need the basics on what each symbol on the chart represents. Here I've selected carbon. Its symbol is the uppercase C. It's number six on the chart. This number equals the number of protons in the nucleus. This is called the atomic number. This number is the atomic mass. It's the sum of the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus. The units, of course, are in atomic mass units. Now, all carbon atoms have six protons. In fact, the chemical properties of an element are determined by the number of protons in the nucleus. But not every atom of every element has an equal number of neutrons. For example, most carbon atoms, almost 99%, do have six protons and six neutrons. However, we find some have seven or even eight neutrons. The six proton, six neutron carbon has a mass of 12 atomic mass units, so we call it carbon 12. The others with seven or eight neutrons, we call carbon 13 and carbon 14 respectively, because that's what their masses are. If you look at the periodic chart for the mass of carbon, you'll see it's listed as 12.01 or even 12.0107. That's the average mass of the different forms of carbon isotopes. You'll notice that none of the elements on the periodic chart have nice whole numbers for their masses because isotopes exist for all of the elements known. Now, even though they have different masses, each atom of each element have identical chemical properties. 
Carbon-12 and 13 are what we call stable isotopes, meaning that their nuclei do not lose particles or energy. Carbon-14 is unstable. Its nucleus will emit energy and particles. This activity makes it radioactive. Radioactive isotopes have atomic nuclei that will break down, or we say, radioactively decay into a more stable nucleus. The decay process gives off very powerful electromagnetic energy and high energy particles. Carbon-14 goes through something known as beta decay. It decays into a stable form of nitrogen-14. Radiation is measured in dosages, and in certain dosages, this energy is harmful to living things. But the truth is, your body is bathed in radio radioactivity all the time. In fact, a small percentage of carbon in your body is carbon-14. A larger source of radiation from your body is a radioactive isotope called potassium-40. You have small amounts of uranium-238, thorium-232, and rubidium-87, all of which are radioactive. So, yeah, you're, you're radioactive, and so are other living things. Radioactivity is a normal energy in nature. It's the duration and the amount of radiation a living thing is exposed to that's a concern. Radioactive isotopes, or radioisotopes for short, have many useful applications in biology. Because they're detectable with the right instruments, radioisotopes are useful as tracers to find out how a living thing processes certain compounds. Radioactive calcium can be used to learn about bone formation and other uses of calcium by cells. Other forms are successfully used in cancer diagnosis and treatments. We'll learn about how they've been used throughout history to unlock the secrets of the cells. And you may even be familiar with the use of radioisotopes to find the age of fossils. Other than their radioactivity, we're usually not at all interested in the nucleus of the atom as far as biology is concerned. The energy of chemical reactions between atoms involves the electrons speeding around the nucleus. This is what we're interested in. The negatively charged electrons are attracted to the positive protons in the nucleus. These electrons have energy and can perform chemical work. We see this work as chemical reactions. The electrons hang out in specific energy levels called electron shells. You'll remember that electrons in the shell closest to the nucleus have less energy than those in shells further from the nucleus. Those electrons involved in chemical reactions are the outermost energy level electrons called the valence shell electrons. When atoms absorb energy, they do so by bumping an electron to a higher energy level. When plants absorb sunlight and perform photosynthesis, electrons are moved from compound to compound in a complicated energy transfer process. The energy of these electrons gets stored in organic compounds and is the way that almost all energy enters living things. All right, that's enough for now. I think you've got enough to think about. In the next video, we'll talk about chemical reactions and the energy required to do so. Don't forget to do your reading. If you've got any questions, write them down now. Bring them to class. And until then, be well.